afternoon, everybody. Thanks for being here. Um, I'll take a few minutes to talk about a little bit about who I am, uh, the issues I'm leading with in this campaign, and what the goals of the campaign are. So I'm a recently retired Teamster. I worked construction before that. Uh, but I was in those jobs to pay the rent. I've really been a activist in movements for civil rights, peace, labor, the environment mm-hmm. since the 1960s. I got involved as a teenager in the San Francisco Bay Area when, when a lot of stuff was going on. And at that time, I became committed after seeing both the Democrats and Republicans fail on the question of civil rights in 1964. You know, Reagan was running around the state to repeal a fair housing law that had just passed, the Run for Fair Housing Act. They got it repealed in a referendum at the end of the year. And the Democrats sat the Dixiecrats from Mississippi instead of the Mississippi Freedom Democrats who had been organized by the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, brought an integrated slate, and Johnson sent the liberals, Humphrey, Mondale, Joseph Rao, to tell them they had to wait. So I was asking, well, where is my party? And I later learned that John Lewis asked that question the year before at the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom, speaking on behalf of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. So for me, the first party I could support was the Peace and Freedom Party in 1968, and that was part of a broader federation of state progressive parties called the Party, 1972 and 1976. I supported those campaigns. And then in 1980, the Citizens Party ran Barry Commoner, who at the time was the country's most prominent environmental scientist. And uh, in the meantime, I got involved in a lot of different social movements. You know, I was uh, active in the anti-war movement. My draft number came up, so I enlisted in the Marines to join the GI movement against the war within the service. And then, uh, I won't go into all the details, but they left me in limbo. And so I wasn't able to go back to college. So I started organizing against nuclear power. And we formed the Clamshell Alliance, which occupied the Seabrook nuclear power plant site. We had 1,414 people arrested. It kind of kicked off a whole nuclear movement across the country. So, in 1984, in August, there was a meeting, invitation only, where they tried to pull together people to talk about forming a Green Party in our country. Uh, the German Greens had just elected 35 people to their national legislature, the Bundestag, like our House of Representatives. And people here and around the world were saying, maybe we should do that in our country. So they asked the clamshell Alliance to send a couple people. So I was one of them. And my message to that meeting, which people accepted, was, we can't build a national party out of a presidential campaign. We got to go out and organize local groups and and then start in electoral politics at the local level and build this thing from the bottom up, which is something I still believe. So why the hell am I running for president? Well, a number of Greens uh, early in 2019 drafted me basically I was kind of minding my own business. I had just finished a run for governor in New York, third run. They run me three times. We got enough to get a ballot every time. And because the two parties changed the law and they could cut my pension, they did. I took a job at the post office. I'm working 12 hour shifts in November, December, and early January. And they opened my email and these people are like saying, we want you to run for president. And they've got a whole campaign organized. And so I had to look at that and After a couple of months, I said, okay, we formed an exploratory committee and then announced at the end of May last year. Um, You know, these are people like Bruce Dixon, who was a friend of mine. He passed last summer. He was the managing editor of Black Agenda Report. He was in Atlanta. And people right across the country out there to California, Matt Gonzalez, the almost mayor of San Francisco, almost beat Gavin Newsom back in 2003. So I had to pay attention. So... We agreed that we would have two major goals for this campaign. One is to put forward green solutions to these problems that the major parties are not solving and force them into the national debate and really run a serious national campaign. And the other was to build the Green Party. And so I'll first talk about, you know, those issues that I'm leading with and then a little bit about party building and then we'll go to questions and answers. So I'm leading with three life or death issues the climate, the new nuclear arms race, and inequality. And inequality is a life or death issue because working class living standards 
have declined, life expectancies are declining. Makes it a life or death issue. People got to choose between going to the doctor and paying the rent or utilities. So uh, those are the three issues I'm addressing. That with respect to the climate change, when I ran for governor in 2010, I was the first candidate in this country to run on a Green New Deal. And we have a very detailed eco-socialist Green New Deal. It's got a detailed budget. It's a $42 trillion 10-year program, $27 trillion to transform the economy so that it is uh, zero to negative carbon emissions and 100% clean energy by 2030. And that's because the carbon budgets the climate scientists have given us say a rich country like the United States has got to do, uh, make that goal by 2030 if we're going to avoid uh, the worst of climate change. And there's a lot of details in that program, and maybe in the question and answer we can go into it, but the main part of it, the eco-socialist part of it, is that we've got to do what this country did during the World War II emergency, when it took over a quarter of the manufacturing capacity of the country, and through the off the war mobilization and then later the War Production Board planned how to turn industry on a dime into what they called the arsenal of democracy, which armed the US, the UK, and Russia to defeat the Nazis. And we need to do nothing less through the public sector to defeat climate change. So our Green New Deal, it's public power. We take over the oil and gas companies and plan a rapid transition to 100% clean energy and power production. But that's only 28% of the carbon footprint. We got to transform manufacturing, transportation, agriculture, and buildings if we're going to get to zero to negative emissions by 2030. So we're calling for a national rail corporation or transportation corporation that would rebuild the rails and electrify them. So we would rebuild light rails like we used to have in every city in this country between the 1890s and 1930s. We would electrify and densify the freight rails and put a lot more of the freight on the rails than the roads for the long hauls. And then we would build high-speed bullet trains between the cities, uh, and that would reduce the need for uh, short and intermediate range air travel. And I think we should bring the airlines under this uh, National Transportation Corporation. They're cheap right now. I mean, it'd be a good time to take them over. And they're not going to do it under Trump or Biden, but it would be a good time. But we need to do that to coordinate the scheduling. Before they deregulated the, regulated the airlines, they did plan the, the travel uh, you know, between cities in the airlines uh, so that you didn't have overcapacity. And we're gonna need to do the same thing with transportation. The third sector is manufacturing. We need to transform most of our manufacturing technology and processes. So take steel. We do it mostly with coke ovens now, which release carbon because coke is a derivative of coal and they heat it up and it, carbon goes into the atmosphere. You can produce steel with electric arc furnaces and the industry is actually moving that way. But if we don't do it through the public sector, they're not gonna move fast enough. Same thing with power. They got server mechanical grids depending on centralized nuclear and coal and now natural gas power plants. And if we're gonna to go to the distributed solar and wind energy, we need a digital smart grid. But the utilities aren't gonna build that until their server mechanical grid wears out and maybe not even then because they'll resist it because they like to do what they're doing and they're making money doing that and you can go through all the technology cement is an important one cement production is five percent of the world's carbon footprint because they throw calcium carbonate into the mix the calcium hardens the cement and the carbonate part the carbon goes up in the atmosphere and that's a huge contribution to global warming there are other ways of making cement. And we can go through all the industries and we got to rebuild our manufacturing basis, not just be empowered by clean energy, but zero waste. In other words, we recycle the materials that don't go into the product and then the product comes back to the manufacturer when it's used up and this stuff gets recycled. And that will reduce the need to, uh, you know, for mining and extracting things from the earth, which is environmentally uh, damaging and also putting waste back into the earth. So. That's why we got to do it through the public sector. And there are other industries I want to bring into public control, like the arms industry. You know, war should not be a profit opportunity. It should be something if we have to do it, uh, we produce the arms, but it's, it's done at cost for public benefit, not for the private profit of these warmongers. So uh, that's the Eco Socialist Green New Deal. That's a serious solution or response to the climate crisis. 
And in the inequality crisis, you know, we have a 20 year life expectancy gap between our richest and poorest counties. And if you broke that down by census tracts, it would be even more stark. Uh, the man that lived downstairs where from where I'm sitting now last year, he was on Medicaid, low age worker, 60 years old. And he decided at the end of March, his utility bill, it's the end of winter, he'd pay that in his rent rather than buy the kidney medicine, which Medicaid told him he had to do, he had been doing, but he decided he'd skip it this month. And by mid-April, his kidneys had failed. That's the kind of thing that's happening over and over again. And that's why uh, in this rich country, working class people, our life expectancies have been going down. So what I'm calling for is an economic bill of rights. And that's six rights to a job, an income, housing, healthcare, education, and a secure retirement. For jobs, I want to expand what we did during Works Progress Administration during the uh, New Deal, which is where local governments would plan public services and public works or infrastructure. And so when you're unemployed, can't get a good job in the private sector, you go to the employment office instead of the unemployment office and say, I want my job. And there are jobs on the shelf ready to go in these public services and public works projects. And that would be a job guarantee. To guarantee an income above poverty, we need to build that into the tax structure. So if your income is less than the poverty line, which, absolutely, which has to be raised, uh, it's really about two thirds of what it ought to be. But if it's below the poverty line, then the government sends you checks uh, to bring you up above poverty. And if you're over the poverty line, you pay your taxes on a progressive basis. Uh, for housing, we have over half a million people now out on the streets. Uh, they can't afford housing. And so uh, to stop that from getting worse because the rent is rising, we have housing shortages, the private housing markets never provided affordable housing. They aim toward the upscale market where they can make more money. We got to have uh, universal rent control so that we can stem the tide of homelessness and people paying more than they should for their rent. In this country right now, uh, a quarter of the people pay more than half their income for rent. The federal standard of affordability is 30% of income. And a quarter of the people, um, half the people pay more than that. So that's the immediate stopgap. But what I do, and this is part of the Eco-Socialist Green New Deal, we're gonna build 25 million units of new public housing in the next 10 years. It's a $2.5 trillion program. It's similar to what uh, AOC and Sanders put forward, their Green New Deal public housing program, except it's 20 times bigger. And it's 20 times bigger because that's what the need is. We want to do public housing the right way, like they do in Europe. Everybody can go to public housing in Europe. They reserve slots for low income people, but you have professionals and you have regular working class folks in public housing. It's not just segregated housing for poor people. And in this country, it's been segregated housing for poor people of color and they built those projects in the worst part of town. We want to build them all over, suburbs, inner city, exurbs, uh, small towns, and there'll be good developments that you know any community would welcome. And we reserve 40% of the units for low income because there's 10 million low income people that don't have access to affordable housing. So that's why we're 10 times or 20 times bigger than you know, what Sanders and AOC put in because that's the need. Uh, so that's the housing program. Healthcare, we want Medicare for all, but we want to expand it from national health insurance, which is what the Medicare for all proposals are on the table now in Congress, what Bernie Sanders was campaigning for. We want to do that the first year, cover everybody. The single public payer pays for all medically necessary services. But over the next decade, we want to expand that into a fully socialized medical system so that the hospitals and clinics are publicly owned. And you don't have this wasteful competition between hospitals where they build more MR or they buy more MRIs and try to attract customers. And meanwhile, in the poor neighborhoods, there are no doctors, there are no clinics, they're underserved. So, uh, so the, the hospitals and clinics will be publicly owned. The doctors, the nurses, the rest of the healthcare workforce would be uh, public employees working for salaries, uh, not fees for services, which in the hospital organization they try to maximize, they give you tests you don't need. They run you through fast so they can get more uh, fees from more people, and that's not good health care. So when they're salaried, they, they can pay attention to providing health care. And what you need 
and not give you what you don't need. And that's a cost control measure as well. And then the whole system would be democratic. It would be governed by a federation of local health boards. Two thirds of the board members elected by the general public, one third by the healthcare providers. And that's what would, would help guarantee that we have a just allocation of medical resources and a rational allocation of medical resources. So this is a national health service. And there used to be three options in Congress. There was, this goes back to the 70s, the Nixon Republican option, which became the American Affordable Care Act, or what they call Obamacare, you know, mandates on employers and individuals to get private insurance with a government subsidizing some people, which is a subsidy for those profit-making insurance companies. And there was a national health insurance plan. That's a Kennedy bill. That's what we got in Congress right now. And then there was the National Health Service that Ron Dellums wrote with the Medical Committee for Human Rights, who were the veterans of the civil rights and anti-war movements who put people back together after the police messed with them. And they came up with a bill. It's called the uh, Josephine Butler United States Health Service Act. And Josephine Butler was an early uh, black doctor, prominent black doctor, and that so was named after her. And that bill, Dellums carried from 77 till 2003 when uh, then uh, Barbara Lee took over his seat and she carried it until 2013, then she dropped it after Obamacare passed. And so, you know, that's why we need Greens in Congress instead of just Democrats and Republicans. So that's been on the table for a long time and my campaign wants to bring it back into public discussion. So we've done jobs, income, housing, healthcare, education. Uh, we want tuition-free public education from childcare and pre-K right through post-secondary colleges and universities, technical schools, and continuing adult education at public institutions. And a lot of countries do that. The United States is rich. We had City University of New York was tuition-free from 1848 till 1976. We going backwards. And then finally, a secure retirement. And I mentioned my pension had been cut. I have some pension reforms. You can ask me about them. Bernie Sanders actually had the best bill, but uh, it, they haven't done anything. Um, but the immediate thing is uh, the boomers are retiring without savings. They raised their kids, their wages were stagnant, and healthcare and housing and college for the kids have gone through the roof. And the quickest way to solve that problem is the double social security benefits. That's a proposal that was written by a green named Stephen Hill in San Francisco. It's published in the Atlantic Magazine a decade ago. He wrote a book about it. That's the program so everybody can have a secure retirement when they get to that age. So that's the six economic bill of rights. And, you know, this is something that uh, Franklin Roosevelt first proposed to Congress in his last two State of the Union addresses, 1944 and 1945, and asked them to enact. They never did, even when the Democrats had a majority, right on through, you know, to Obama. They've had opportunities to do this. And it wasn't, pieces of it were in the Democratic platform. The last piece that went out was national health insurance uh, with when Clinton got the nomination. Uh, but it was picked up by the civil rights movement. You know, they called for an economic bill of rights, including that guaranteed income, which is not in Sanders' 21st century bill of rights, which is, you know, something that I think is missing. And uh, so they called for that with the March on Washington, the 1966 Freedom Budget, the 1968 Poor People's Campaign. And it really hasn't been brought back since the 60s, and it's time to bring it back. So that's what we want to do. And the reason that... Uh, they put that, at that time, the Civil Rights Movement was about to get the Civil Rights Act passed, the Voting Rights Act passed, and they said, we got to move from civil rights to what they call human rights. And the analysis of A. Philip Randolph and Bayard Rustin and Martin Luther King and Michael Harrington and all the people that put this together was that there's a white backlash for me. Goldwater's mobilizing it. The Dixiecrats are mobilizing it. George Wallace is mobilizing it. And these white working people fear the competition from black people. And so the white backlash was being mobilized. So they figured we'll take the material basis out from under the, what was mobilizing that backlash. And that was the economic insecurity of white working people. So they said the black civil rights movement has to lead a movement for economic rights for everybody in order to secure civil and political rights for black people. And with Donald Trump as president and how he got elected, we're in the same situation. It's like George Wallace finally made it. So I think this program is as relevant for the economic class issues, I'm sorry, as relevant for the racial justice issues as for the economic class issues, because we got to undermine 
uh, the fears of white people that get mobilized behind these racists like Trump. So I think uh, that program, uh, th that's what it can contribute. And then finally, the other life or death issue, which no other presidential candidate is even talking about. Although Mike Gravel did before he dropped out and props to him, he endorsed me in the green primary. I really appreciate that. And that is this new nuclear arms race. We're in the middle of a nuclear modernization. Uh, Obama administration initiated it. Trump is continuing it. It's multi-trillion dollars. They are turning strategic nukes into hypersonic nukes that are six times faster than the old strategic nukes. The old strategic nukes, you had 20 minutes to launch on warning and figure out if the warning was not a false alarm. Now it's so fast that you launch when you think the other might launch. So that's why the bullets in the atomic science has moved a doomsday clock closer to midnight than they've ever had it. And then we're putting more tactical nukes into conventional forces with an insane military doctrine called escalate to de-escalate. And the US has this and Russia has it. And the idea is if you have a conventional threat, uh, you throw some tactical nukes at it and then you de-escalate, which is a crackpot idea because once nukes start flying, they're gonna go strategic real quick. And so meanwhile, we, all these nuclear treaties have expired or we, we've got out of them. The last bilateral treaty between the United States and Russia is the New START Treaty, Strategic Arms. It expires next February 5th. There is no negotiations going on between the United States and Russia on that. We're in a bad situation. But meanwhile, two years ago, in July 2017, 122 nations agreed to the text of a treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons. And the International Campaign for the Abolition of Nuclear Weapons got the Nobel Peace Prize for that. But how many people in this country even know that? Corporate media hasn't talked about it. Presidential candidates don't talk about it. So that's another existential threat, a life or death issue. So what I'm calling for are nuclear disarmament initiatives. U.S. should pledge no first use of nuclear weapons. It should unilaterally disarm to a minimum credible deterrent. And on the basis of those tension reducing initiatives, go to the other nuclear powers and say, we're ready to negotiate complete and mutual nuclear disarmament. And I think we can get mobi mobilized pub world public opinion on our side, those 122 nations who are scared to death of the nuclear nations. So those are the issues I lead with. And there are dozens of issues and I'm happy to answer questions on all of them. Um, but there's one more issue that always comes up, and that is, okay, Howie, why are you spoiling the election for Biden and the Democrats? And my answer to that is, you guys are spoiling the election. We've given you the answer to spoiled elections. You've been whining about the Greens since the Nader campaign in 2000. And even though you, uh, you won the popular vote, the Republicans got the presidency because of the Electoral College, and in 2000, the Supreme Court. And instead of dealing with the Electoral College, you want to pick on the Greens. And we've given you the answer. The answer is abolish the Electoral College and go to a ranked choice national popular vote for president. Problem solved. And instead, they won't pick on the Greens. It's not a serious answer because most of our votes, you look at the exit polls of Jill Stein in Michigan, you know, the Democrats will say, well, if she wasn't running, we would have won Michigan and won the presidential race. You look at the exit polls, uh, most of those people wouldn't have voted at all. So they can't assume that we are gonna vote for the Democrats if it's the only choice. I mean, we got a miserable choice. Biden, the neoliberal hawk, and Trump, the racist incompetent. So, you know, to think that we're gonna vote for Biden just because the Greens got knocked off the ballot? No. So you know, let's get realistic. And then, you know, the comeback then is, well, that's a constitutional amendment. That'll never happen. And I say, you know, are you gonna whine about it or do something about it? You know, the last constitutional amendment, 27th amendment, that uh, prevented Congress from giving itself a raise in, in the term they're serving and the election had to pass. That was one of Madison's original 12 amendments, the Bill of Rights, the original Bill of Rights. And it sat around for 202 years. And then is actually a student in Texas. He got a C on a paper saying that amendment should pass. He got mad, he started writing legislators. Legislators said, yeah, that's a good idea. Congress was giving itself a lot of raises in the 80s. And so it swept the country. It was an idea whose time has come. And I think what we can do in this campaign is make ranked choice voting an idea whose time has come. We got it in over 20 cities. We now have it in the state of Maine for their elections, including uh, their electoral college votes. So let's take that nationwide. 
And if Biden says, okay, I'll do that, will you get out of the race? I'll say, no, you know, we, we got other issues and we got to keep the pressure on you. You know, if you're going to convince people you're really going to do it, okay, take our votes, but you got to prove it. So anyway, those are some of the issues. Um, and the other thing we're trying to do is build the Green Party um, and build it from the bottom up. We should be electing thousands of candidates as we go into the 2020s. We have 160 elected. That's more than any third party on the left since the heyday of the Socialist Party, but it's a drop in the bucket. There are over half a million elected officers in this country. A lot of times there's no opposition. Green should be scooping those up. In, in every district, we can be the second party. In the cities, the Republicans don't run serious candidates. I know in my city of Syracuse, Republicans are the third party. And in the rural areas, the Democrats don't run serious candidates. So we can be the second party and start a debate because we're not vacuous like the major parties. We bring real issues to the table. And we start a debate, we can start winning those debates. You know, Medicare for all. You know, the corporations say, oh, that's socialism. But the exit polls show uh, all the Biden supporters want it. The public opinion polls show even the majority of Republicans want it. So we can win those debates and win a lot of offices. And that's how we build the party from the bottom up. Local office, state office, we get a caucus in Congress, and then when we have a presidential ticket, nobody will be able to ignore it. So I think that's a strategy going forward. So why the hell am I running for president? Well, we need ballot lines. In about 40 of the states, the result of the presidential election affects whether the Greens will be on the ballot for the next election cycle. It, every state has their own law, but a lot of the states, it's one, two, or three percent of the vote. We get that, they got a ballot line. That makes it easier for the candidates to run in local offices. So that's one objective. Another is we're getting uh, federal matching funds and we're on the way there, the sooner the better, but that gives us a lot of money and it's sort of a benchmark that tells the media and so forth, we got a serious campaign here. And I, ironically, I'm the only candidate in the whole damn country seeking them. The Democrats and Republicans don't want it anymore because if you go for it, you can't spend more than $50 million in the primary. That's not even an issue for us but they spend so much money, they don't even want the primary matching funds. And you know, none of the other Greens are running you know, anywhere near a campaign that's raising that kind of money. So that's the second thing that will give us some credibility with the national media. And so we're really trying to bring this campaign and force ourselves into the debates. And we've sued the Pre Commission on Presidential Debates many times, us and the Libertarians. That sounds like a government agency. In fact, it's a private commission run by the Democrats and Republicans. It's a private corporation. And they muscled aside the League of Women Voters. I think our strategy this year should be appeal to the League of Women Voters to reassert themselves as an impartial civic body and get some major news organizations to cover it. We succeeded in New York when Governor Cuomo wouldn't debate in getting everybody but Cuomo, the Republican, Green, Libertarian, and, and another corporate candidate and uh, happened to be the mayor of my city, and I beat her in Syracuse and statewide. But anyway, um, so uh, the league stepped up then, and I think you know we have a shot of getting into the base. And then the last thing I'm I'm talking about, and, and I'm not going to go into this in detail. You can ask me about it. Is you know Greens are good activists. We show up. People want us there. They let us know when there's a demonstration or there's a public hearing. We're activists. Most of us, my experience is different, but most of us are pissed off former Democrats. You know, we, we were against the war in Iraq and they were for it. Or there's a police brutality incident and the, and the local Democrats are afraid of the police. Or we're fighting fracking and the Democrats are on the other side and so on. So we come as activists and our instinct is, well, we've got to broaden this out, let's get some new people. We go out and preach. We get a leaflet and say, join us. But if you're going to build a diverse grassroots movement, you've got to build relationships. Instead of preaching, you need to listen and go knock on doors, hear what people are saying, go to churches and community organizations and find out and build relationships, build friendships, build trust. And then you can talk more about the politics. And as you do that and you build in, you get yourself in those networks, you can find out who's ready for the Greens. So there's a lot to talk about. We need to learn the kind of stuff union and community organizers know. Uh, and so, so instead of just mobilizing people, we're organizing them. So. I've gone on probably longer than you wanted me to, so I'm gonna stop there and uh, I'll be happy to take your questions. All right, um, so I went over this in the beginning, but people should just put themselves on staff using the chat. 
and then ask your question to Howie. We can't be that shy, can we? No. Ah. Jacob. Yeah, um, well, first of all, thank you so much um, for coming on. Um, and second of all, um, I'm obviously, I'm one of them. I know a lot of, a lot of leftists, myself included, are talking about, have been talking about how trying to reform the Democratic Party is just wasting our time because they're never going to change if, if, if people don't see that after this primary season, it's obvious. It, it should be obvious. So we're talking about how we need, the left needs an independent party for the working class. How can we convince other leftists that the Green Party can be that party? and unite the left? I think we have to credibly demonstrate we can elect people at the local level and point to that. We have the arguments. We can go over the history. We can go back to the People's Party, which crossed endorsed the Democrat in 1896 and committed political suicide. We can talk about how the communists disappeared as an independent movement with a popular front in the 30s, or the socialists with their realignment strategy in the 50s and 60s or the Maoists coming out of the 60s with Jesse Jackson, and now some of the holdout independent groups out of the Trotskyist tradition now going behind Bernie Sanders. And they end up not changing the Democratic Party to get changed by it. I think people have seen the recent uh, reporting on uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and how she's changed her platform. She's not endorsing justice Democrats who helped her get elected and so forth. She's adapting. and. We can make all those arguments, but you know, for most people, it's like, well, where are you? You haven't won anything, doesn't look practical. But we practically can elect local people. And I think that won't happen in 2020 so much, but going forward in the 2020s, it's really gotta be our emphasis. And so then you can say, well, uh, you know, you guys can't win. And we say, we did, we did win. Look, that's gonna be the best argument. And we don't use that argument enough now. You know, we have 160 local elected officials. We don't tout that enough. You know, Shama Sawant, Socialist Alternative elected one, and everybody on the left knows about it. What about our Greens? We don't even know our own people who are slaving away in, you know, public office, working hard. So I think, you know, the way we're gonna win that argument is basically by demonstrating it. And on the other hand, I'm not down uh, playing or discounting the importance of making the intellectual argument, particularly to the ideological left. You, know, you can think of the ideological left, the people that have, you know, read and thought and convinced themselves they're socialists. And then you got the popular left that mobilizes behind single issues. You know, we need single payer health care because I don't have health care. You know, people concerned about a fracking pipeline uh, going through their community and what it might do. Uh, those people I would call the popular left. They got grievances, they're mobilized, but they aren't ideological socialists. So, you know, the message has to be kind of crafted to those different groups. But to the people that say we can't win, we gotta prove them wrong. And I think we can do that by starting at the bottom. Like I said, a lot of races are uncontested. Uh, some officers, nobody wants them. I mean, we just need to step up. And uh, even where there is competition, as I said, in the cities, the Republicans don't run serious campaigns. In the rural areas, the Democrats don't. So in most districts, we can step up and be the second party to start off. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, next is John. I have unmuted you, John. Um, it seems like a lot of Democrats won office back in 218, like a lot of ladies, but they ran as Democrats, and some of them should have been Green Party members, I, I think, and uh, we need to get those type of people running as Green Party people. No. Well, I agree, and I think as we develop from the bottom up, people like AOC, you know, she said recently that in any other country, she and Joe Biden would be in different parties. 
And our objective is, yeah, that's the way it should be. And of course, most of those countries have proportional representation instead of single plurality winner, um, which is one of our, you know, platform planks. And uh, so I agree. And I think the way we get people like her when she was thinking about running in 2018, or even like the whole Justice Democrats group, you know, if the Greens had 10,000 local elected officials in cities and towns and start getting them in the state legislatures, uh, you know, people like that would take a more serious look at us. So, like I said, the last question, our best argument is to demonstrate we can do it at the local level. Thank you. Oh, hold on. No, I'm not muted. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Uh, Annie. Uh, I think to be a little more Colorado specific, um, <clears throat> I think it would be really helpful for us to do some, I guess this is more of a suggestion than a question, but maybe the question is, are you willing to? Uh, I think it would be really, really helpful, especially in the Metro, but I think Colorado overall, to explain why it's important to put our vote towards you and towards a green. What you were mentioning before about, you know, the ballot line access as well as the funding thing. I know that we already have the ability to vote for a green, but I don't think people realize that. Like I get online and I talk to colleagues and comrades and they're all like, oh, my vote's going to be a waste. My vote's going to be a waste. My vote's going to be a waste. And I think a, a huge um, benefit that we have in Colorado is that we should try to combine the fact that people are frustrated. We have a lot of people mobilize and organize, even if they are in these like socialist light groups like DSA and workers, you know, like all those socialist light, that's what they feel like. I think we can get a lot of them behind you and present a really strong image in Colorado of being open, especially because we're already open to ranked choice voting. That's something else that Colorado seems to have a good feel for. I don't know if like, maybe a video or something with you explaining that issue, because you did it so well right now in this town hall, like those two points of like why it's important to run a green as president also, even though people will say, like you said, oh, well, what are you doing locally? What have you done for me locally? That's such an important point that so many people don't know. I didn't know it till I became a green and Andrea explained it to me. So I mean, I, I think that that could be huge in Colorado and maybe elsewhere, but definitely here, even just that, that snippet would be really, I think it would go viral explaining that and making people feel like their vote would still matter. Because right now I feel like Colorado especially has a lot of, um, not, maybe not disenfranchised obviously, but just disappointed and they feel like, well, I'm just not gonna vote then, screw it. I'm just not gonna do it. And I don't think they realize that their vote for a third party candidate like you actually would carry weight and make a difference. And I think that maybe doing something and sharing it and helping it go viral would be huge. Well, I've done that rap that you referred to here many times on these Zoom and other forums. So it must be out there. And I don't know how to edit video, but there are people in my campaign that do. I think that's a good suggestion. Uh, I would just add more to that argument. When they say, don't waste your vote, you should say, don't you waste your vote. A vote for Biden is a wasted vote. If you're a progressive that wants Medicare for all, if you want a Green New Deal, if you want a new direction for our foreign and military policy so we stop being the world's global military empire and start being its world's humanitarian superpower, uh, then a vote for Biden is a vote for the people that oppose you. Biden said he would veto Medicare for all if it crossed his desk as president. He doesn't have a Green New Deal. He's been a hawk his whole career. So don't waste your vote. Vote for what you want and make the politicians deal with your vote. Um, sometimes I talk about, I got 5% of the vote in 2014 against Andrew Cuomo. And Andrew Cuomo wanted to roll up the vote that year. He wanted to run for president. He wanted to get more votes than his daddy got, Mario Cuomo. He wanted to get more votes than he got winning in 2010. And he got less. And he looked over and here the damn Greens with 5% of the vote. So he had to look at what we were demanding, and we were demanding a ban on fracking, uh, $15 minimum wage, paid family leave, and tuition-free public college. And he moved on all those issues because he had to compete. So if you vote for Biden, they don't know if you're a Sanders socialist or a Biden corporatist. You get lost in the sauce. 
a vote for the green, everybody knows what it means. So don't waste your vote and vote for Biden. Vote for the greens and make it count. Thank you. And next is Desmond. Okay, I'm, I'm, well, I'm okay. trying. Okay. okay, now can you hear me? There I am. Yes. Great. Hi, Howie. Hi. Uh, I'm a green and I'm on the executive board of ranked choice voting for Colorado. And one of the things that excites me this 2020 election is that Maine will be the one and only state which will be using ranked choice voting on their uh, presidential ballot. So, you know, people could actually rank you number one, go out on a limb and then rank Biden number two. You know, uh, how's, how do you view this, uh, you know, as an opportunity for your campaign this cycle, the first time, you know, a green can actually kind of explore this area? Well, I think Maine should be a priority for us in terms of campaigning and really work the media there and the people because they can vote for me if they like what I'm saying. And then, you know, we all want Trump out of there. He's a damn fool. I mean, he's killing us with this coronavirus response. They don't have to worry about that in Maine. So I think, you know, extra attention to Maine to demonstrate also that ranked choice voting uh, means a third party can get a significant vote and it's not going to quote unquote spoil the election. So I think Maine should be a priority and uh, California should. I mean, Trump is so dead in California that, uh, that, you know, people are free to vote for a third party there without, even without ranked choice voting. And my state of New York, obviously, um, I do have a base here and uh, we have the same situation. And then we got, I don't know if we can do this now, but I want to go to Guam. Guam has an advisory vote. Climate change is sinking their home. And I got cousins who are Asian in Hawaii and we were talking about going to Guam and leafleting the whole damn island and winning Guam. But with this social distancing, I don't know if that's gonna happen. It's also a hell of an expensive uh, plane ticket. So, uh, but you know, we, we're thinking about some of the places, but Maine is definitely, because of ranked choice voting, gonna be a priority. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, the, I, have, I have two questions. You've been around the country now uh, and have seen uh, the state of the Green Party in, in individual states. And from what I can see, it's pretty dysfunctional at the state level. There's, uh, there's really no organization, organizing going on. Um, you're, you're the one that is organizing Greens right now. And so how do we move forward? Uh, many states are full of uh, recalcitrant, liberal people who are not interested in growing the party. They're interested in sitting around with two or three other people and just shaking their fist at the machine. So how do we move the ball forward there? And my second question for you is, how do we as uh, cisgendered white cats who are of a certain age, how do we uh, deal with um, uh, identity politics, because there's a lot of that going on in this primary for the Green Party. So I'm going to shut up now and let you let you go. Okay, well, I, the Green Party's unevenly developed. Some states are pretty well organized. They can all improve. And some are what you described. They're paper parties. You've got a little click kind of holding the franchise and not doing any organizing. And they tend to be you know, the people you call the liberals. And my, my message to lefties is out organize the liberals. If there are three people running your state party, I mean, it shouldn't be too hard to out organize them and out vote them. And uh, so I think that's what we need to do. I think going forward, uh, a lot of state parties are starting to do this. This is something Bruce Dixon and I were working on. Uh, we would like the Green Party to be what left parties have been since the 19th century. It was an invention of the left. Uh, you know, the old parties were top down, funded by elites. You know, take the Whigs and the Tories in England. 
you know, the Whigs or the Tories were the old landed elite and the Whigs were the upcoming professional and business class. And, you know, they had the elite sponsors and they'd mobilize the vote for the House of Commons. And as the working class fought for the franchise and then organized what became the Labor Party, they said, you know, we don't have no rich folks sponsoring us. We're going to have to pay for this ourselves. So like they did with their trade unions, they charge members dues. So you join the party, you agree to the basic principles, and you pay dues. And that creates a steady funding base. It's also a much simpler way to measure who's a member. It's a common standard. Right now, the Green Party uses all kinds of proxies to figure out what's going on. How many votes did you get? How many candidates did you get? How many are registered in your party? But it's apples to oranges because in a lot of states, you can't register. 23 states, you can't register in a party. State doesn't keep the registration. You show up in an open primary and ask for a party's ballot. And there's no record kept of which ballot you took. So uh, you don't have registration. So then they got to say, we got X number on our petitions. And the formula is so complicated I don't think anybody, even the people that developed it, really understand how it works. So we had a situation like Texas. They ran some candidates in 2018. They came short of the threshold to keep their ballot line. It's very hard to get a ballot line in Texas. Texas party just sort of walked away. They said, it's hopeless. And they got a ballot line back because the Republicans gave it to them because the Republicans felt, well, the libertarians are nipping at our heels. Let's get the Greens to nip at the Democrats' heels. So thank you, Republican Party. We got the line back in Texas. But the Texas Party, at the time they got their delegates to the National Committee and Convention, increased by 50%, didn't even exist. So we need to have a realistic measure that's common for everybody. So I think the dues-paying structure, it's more democratic because you know who the members are, and they're the ones that can hold leaders accountable. They get the vote. Uh, you get a steady source of funding. And... Uh, it's a real measure, you know, of, of what you've really got. Um, we have probably half a million people that identify and vote green in this country. There are about 250,000 registered in green parties where we can do that, which is less than half the states actually, because there are states that do keep registration, but the greens aren't on the ballot and they don't have registration for greens in that state yet. And then there are those 23 states where you can't even do it. So just, double that, you know, make that rough assumption. You know, we should be able to organize 50,000, a fifth of them, or even 10% of them. That would be, uh, I'm sorry, 50,000 would be 10%, or 5%, that would be uh, 25,000. You know, that would put us, uh, we'd be one of the largest organizations on the left right there, and we could build from that. So I think that's where we need to move going forward. And as far as the uh, cisgender white male thing and identity politics, Look, uh, there's good identity politics, there's bad identity politics. There's identity politics organized around people who are oppressed and organizing around that identity to fight the oppression is good. And then there's bad identity politics, like the white identity politics that Trump mobilized in order to oppress. And, you know, I think the question is not who you are and where you came from, but where you're going. Are you an anti-racist? You know, are you an anti-sexist? Do you support gay rights? And are you active in solidarity with those movements and those fights? That's a more important question. Um, sometimes the, the identity politics becomes tokenism. So, you know, the Greens are mostly white party and they want to put a black face up there and say, oh, this will attract black people. You know, I would argue, no, you know, they, <laughs> the grassroots see enough tokenism. They want to see people they know in their communities that are working with them on real issues. That's how we diversify this party and build its base in the working class among people of color and among youth, the people that are voting in the lowest numbers because I would argue they're alienated. They're not apathetic. I've done enough Nordocking to know that there are people out there, man, you knock on the door and start to listen and they'll go on for a long time about, you know, their complaints. You know, black community, this community I've been is mostly black. These people are Democrats, not because they love the Democratic Party, because they're afraid of the Republicans. To them, it's like the Ku Klux Klan. And, you know, but they aren't happy with the Democrats. You know, you knock on their door, they say, you know, my city council rep never been on my doorstep. You know, and then they start telling you. And I've done that so much, some people think I got elected. So I run across people on the street, 
and they'll say, you know, we got a sewer back up on you know, such and such a street, or my landlord hasn't fixed my thing. Can you help us out? And I say, well, uh, you know, have you talked to the city council? Say, I thought you were the city council. So that's what we got to do. We got to get out there at the grassroots and build relationships. So that for people, the Green Party is not an abstract face on a poster they see on TV, but it's right there. They know who the people are and they trust them. Thank you. One second. Victoria, you're up. Hi, I hello. <laughs> um, I just wanted to know if there was anything we could do as a national party to kind of repair the relationship from with um, the Georgia Green Party and the and the transgender community um, and LGBTQ in general. Um, there were some comments made last month, and I think it kind of turned some people off. I'm originally from Georgia, just a little backstory. I live in Colorado now. And a lot of my friends are a little discouraged with the state party in Georgia. And is there anything that we can do to kind of repair that and fix, you know, and, and let people know that that's not at all our agenda. And, and that one comment was not indicative or, you know, it doesn't define our party as a whole as the, as, you know, the, the national party. Well, I think Georgia for anybody paying close attention is an outlier in the green party so that's number one i think that's made clear as soon as they made the statement i put out a statement urging them to reconsider and that i you know said trans rights are human rights they're not in conflict with women's rights and uh so now there's been discussions i know some people were saying we should expel the green party in georgia for making that statement and i think that's the wrong approach i mean we're always splitting on the left this is something we got to talk through and educate and, you know, come to some kind of better understanding. So that's the approach I think we should take. But the party as a whole should make it clear that's not the position of the National Green Party and the state parties can make their positions clear. And, uh, you know, we just need to talk to the folks in Georgia and also maybe, you know, in the course of the campaign, organize some people that are opposed to that decision by the Georgia party. Because um, I'm not convinced and I haven't studied it closely that that wasn't, you know, I, as Jason was pointing out some of these parties are pretty insular and small group and there's a lot of followers out there they don't even know they're being represented at state committee level um, so you know I think that's another way to approach it as well thank you hi Hannah Hello. Um, yeah, I'm a pharmacy technician at a Walgreens. We don't get masks. In fact, our company originally released a statement to its employees um, saying, oh, you're not frontline healthcare workers, you're retail, so you don't need PPE, um, which is absurd. I mean, we give people drugs and vaccines and we kind of need protection from the 400 people we see in a day. Um, what would be your response to coronavirus should you get in into the position or um, I'm not really sure how to phrase it, but what would you do about coronavirus? I got about 20 things on my list. I was trying to look for it quickly, so I probably won't remember them all. But obviously, the first thing we got to do is uh, have the Defense Production Act invoke get some generals and business people that know logistics get the stuff produced and distributed to where it is by a federal plan this you know trump relying on private industry and the market and in the fema bidding up the prices when the states are trying to get it uh is insane so that that's one thing uh medicare should pay for uh treatment as well as testing treatment goes average i saw recently was thirty five thousand dollars and I've seen bills up to $75,000 for people that have been intubated with the ventilators. Um, we need to uh, make sure that, uh, oh, if we're gonna reopen the economy, it shouldn't be reopened until we have mass testing, tracing, and quarantining those who are infected and those they contacted. And, uh, you know, South Korea has done that, some other Asian countries, that's the way to do, reopen the economy safely. Um, so those I think are the, are the immediate things in terms of dealing with the infections. 
um, the social distancing has to continue until we get that testing. And then we've got this coronavirus depression we're in. Um, so we should have did what they did in Denmark, and that is basically have like social insurance for businesses so they could pay payroll and everybody keeps getting the money they're getting. And they have a better social welfare state so people that weren't working were getting income and everybody's income was maintained. Um, at this point, that $1,200 ain't gonna do it. Uh, and I support you know, what Bernie Sanders called for, $2,000 a person per month for the duration. Um, there should be a moratorium on evictions, foreclosures, and utility shutoffs. Um, some people are calling for people to, you know, a moratorium on rent and mortgages and utilities. I think that's a mistake. That would cause a string of bankruptcies. About half of small businesses have barely enough cash reserves to last a month, just paying rent, mortgage, or, and or utilities. So you destroy, you know, half the small businesses. Small businesses employ half the people in the country. There's like 10 or 11 million mom and pop landlords, you know, retired people, working class people, you know, got a rental property. Maybe it's a duplex that they live in themselves. Um, you don't want to wreck them and then have them go into foreclosure because who's going to scoop it up? It's going to be Blackstone, which scooped up all those houses foreclosed after the uh, uh, Great Recession in 2008. So instead of that, there should be forbearance. In other words, until the money is in the hands of the tenants and the utility bill payers and the mortgage payers, forbearance by the, those that are supposed to receive those. But the federal government should make up the difference between what people can afford to pay and what the real bill is. And so that would be a you know, means-tested program to pay the difference. So the small businesses, as well as the utilities and the big banks that hold mortgages, get their money. So we don't make the economic depression worse than it already is. Um, and then getting out of the de uh, depression, look, we were, coronavirus triggered an economic recession, and that's much now a depression as a total collapse, but we were headed that way. I mean, it's a chronic problem of capitalism that it creates excess capacity over production, and when they're not profitable investments to be made, uh, the investments stop and you get a bust. And that's where we were headed, with a huge debt overhang that is as big as we had going into the Great Recession. So we come out of the uh, coronavirus, say we're testing, tracing, and activating, uh, uh, quarantining. And so why is business going to invest? Um, it, it doesn't have a, a profit motive to do so. That's where the Eco-Social Green New Deal comes in. You know, about three trillion a year in new productive assets. Um, there's a study out from one of the San Francisco Federal Reserve Bank says after natural disasters or pandemics, historically, you've had decades of economic doldrums in contrast to a war where we blow everything up and then we got to rebuild it. And there are plenty of opportunities. That's why we had that boom after World War II until about 1970. Well, we need to create an artificial boom. We got to replace all our old manufacturing and dirty technologies with clean technologies, clean transportation, clean energy production, clean agriculture, organic agriculture. We got a lot of work to do. So that requires a massive public investment to get us out of the a coronavirus depression. And uh, another thing that's on the green platform that is uh, something that is not popularly understood, but you know, to, to spend that three trillion a year, we're gonna have to have more progressive taxes, financial transactions tax, land value tax, wealth tax, estate tax, more progressive income taxes, of, households or personal and business, um, but that won't be enough. We need to, new priorities. I'm calling for 75% cut in the military budget and put that money into the Green New Deal, but that still won't be enough. We're gonna have to borrow. Of course, the Green Party has a way of getting that money without borrowing. You know, the modern money theory people say we can borrow as much as we need to because we're, you know, the dollar is the world's reserve currency and, uh, you know, we can, borrow what we need to do. But what often people think as well, the Fed can support that by creating credits and then buying treasury bonds that are on the market. And that's true, but the thing is, it's not free money, even though the Fed created the money to buy the bonds. We gotta pay the principal and interest on those bonds in the end. And that public debt crowds out uh, other federal spending. It crowds out private investment. It's a burden we don't need to carry. 
So what we have called for in the Green Party, it's called greening the dollar and the platform. It's really a modern version of the greenback proposal of the farmer labor populist movement after the Civil War. Lincoln paid for the Civil War in part by just issuing greenbacks, dollars, U.S. notes, not Federal Reserve notes. And we can do that in paper and digital form if we get rid of the Federal Reserve, have a monetary authority in the Treasury, and they would create these greenbacks and spend them into the economy through the federal budget. And that would be debt-free money created by the government, which is right there in the Constitution, it says we can coin money. And the courts have said that includes paper money. It's not just literal coins. So uh, the problem is the only parties in the world that have that on their platforms are the Green Parties of the United States and England and Wales. Uh, so I think we're going to have to borrow in the short term because we got a lot of public education to do on that radical monetary reform. But uh, so I'm getting way off from COVID, but that's how we pay for the Eco Socialist Green New Deal that gets us out of the COVID depression. Hi, Desmond. Hey, I'm back. Um, on top of being on the executive board of Ranked Choice Voting for Colorado, I'm also on the executive board of the Psychedelic Club of Denver. Um, and, you know, I helped uh, organize the Denver Green Party's endorsement of Initiative 301, which decriminalized the possession of psilocybin mushrooms, which has kind of gone into other uh, city cities have enacted similar uh, legislation. Yeah, well, I, I did write. I did write the endorsement. Andrea is right. Uh, anywho, uh, you know there was ample research coming out in the fifties and sixties about the benefits of. Uh, you know, psychedelics and mental health, and, you know, as far as alcoholism, opi opioid addiction, that's just now kind of getting uh, re, re examined now that uh, there's kind of been a slow movement within the FDA to kind of open up those uh, research opportunities. Uh, you know, this does kind of pose a existential threat to the traditional pharmaceuticals like, you know, Prozac and everything because they want to keep you on those drugs as long as they can, whereas psychedelics might be a, you know, once every six months type treatment, you know, that doesn't really, you know, uh, play well with the uh, capitalist model of pharmaceuticals of growth, 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 growth. Um, so, how, you know, kind of keeping this in mind, you know, and your position on Medicare for all and, you know, making medicine more socialized, how do you, how can you use this, you know, psychedelic movement as an opportunity to kind of open the doors to making medicine more socialized and kind of going back to more, you know, uh, traditional plant medicines versus kind of the chemicals that, you know, people are kind of hesitant to use? Well, first of all, I favor decriminalization of all illicit drugs uh, for, you know, if you possess it it should be a violation, not a criminal charge. A violation like it is in Portugal, where, you know, if you got an opioid or um, cocaine or something, they uh, give you a violation and you show up to a little three-person commission, a lawyer, social worker, and a doctor, and they look at your situation from a health-centered approach. You know, drug addiction and drug abuse should be treated as a health problem, not a criminal problem. So that's number one. And in Portugal, since they did that in 2001, drug overdoses, drug crimes, uh, even the number of people using these illicit drugs have all gone way down, uh, particularly the crimes and the uh, uh, overdoses. Um, and more people are getting drug treatment. Um, and even let people that want to stay high, they pay a fine and go about their business um, until next time. And, you know, maybe they're ready to, you know, get some treatment or change the situation. For some people, it's they're depressed and the drugs are an escape and they need a good job. I mean, that's the kind of thing this commission does, deals with people's real needs. Uh, so I think that's the approach we should take. Um, <clears throat> you mentioned the FDA was loosening up. I'm not into the details on that. I know AOC and some others had a bill to uh, open up the ability for that research to be done, uh, which I think is important because as you pointed out, Big Pharma's business model is to produce the drugs you got to take all the time, forever. You know, you mentioned Prozac, 
Viagra, heart medicine, that kind of stuff. And they are not working on uh, short-term treatments. You know, most famously now, antivirals or antibiotics with this drug-resistant bacteria that's a danger. Or vaccines. Because, you know, you get a vaccine, it's just one shot. They pay one time and that's it. So we need to socialize big pharma. That, I didn't mention that, but that should, it should be brought under the uh, rubric of a national health service so that they are public utilities that operate at cost for public benefit, not for private profit. Um, because they haven't, 15 of the 18 largest uh, pharmaceutical companies do not do any research on vaccines, antivirals, or antibiotics. We pay for that through the National Health Service, and then we hand it over to the private sector to profit from it. Uh, that's not a good use of our money. So, and I think the same goes for these psychedelics. Uh, there's one drug in there, I was reading in the literature, Igobane or something? What's that called? For dealing Iboga. with the, hmm? Iboga, Iboga is the plant, Ibogaine is the medicine in the plant. Right. And I've been hearing for years from one of these old yippy marijuana peddlers that that's the solution to heroin. And, you know, his name's Dana Beal. I don't know. He's a character. Uh, he goes back to Jerry Ruman and the whole original group. But, uh, you know, I think that's the kind of thing that uh, should be researched and, you know, available to, you know, doctors. And uh, if it works, it works and use it instead of, you know, I guess the other thing is methadone, which is not even, if you get proper doses of heroin, it's less bad on your system than methadone is what I've heard. So, the, 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 you know, so you don't even get high with methadone, but you aren't using heroin. It's kind of a moral thing, but it doesn't, it's worse for your health. Assuming, you know, the problem is you get street heroin, you know, you don't know what's in it and you can OD and so forth. So anyway, uh, yeah, decriminalize the hard drugs drug treatment on demand in the medical system, and bring big pharma under public and de public and democratic public control. All right, thank you, Howie. Uh, I do believe we have Lana next on st stack. Hello, Lana. Anna, I can't actually um, unmute you, but hold on. I see you are uh, Can typing. you hear me now? Yes. All right, uh, one sec. My question is just, have you considered uh, reaching out to say climate strike organizations for their endorsements, like uh, the youth led ones? Um, it depends on the organization. Um, that was a coalition effort. Groups like Sunrise are pretty committed to the Democratic Party at this point. I mean, we've had discussions, not just me, but lots of Greens with them. And uh, they Sunrise Movement, you know, they stole our brand, the Green New Deal. And by the time it got into Congress, it was diluted. You know, the uh, non-binding resolution for a Green New Deal dropped key parts of the Green Party's Green New Deal. The ban on fracking the new fossil fuel infrastructure, the phase out of nuclear power, the deep cuts in military spending. And they extended the deadline from 2030 to 2050. Um, so I think they have a bit of a guilty conscience and right now they're still, you know, their leadership very committed to the Democrats. So now they're making demands on Biden. On the other hand, you know, I went to a number of the climate strikes. I know the people here in, in the local area, um, and we would welcome their endorsement. We really haven't had a phase of the campaign where we're seeking endorsements, uh, from groups like that. Uh, we may get there. Um, right now we're just trying to get greens to vote for us in the green primaries and raise money so we can get matching funds and get us on the ballot. That's, you know, a major commitment of my campaign. Green Party nationally is weak because the state parties are weak and the way it's structured. I mean, the National Green Party should have enough money that they can support field organizers in every state. And when, you know, somebody calls from, say, North Dakota, where we don't really have a party and wants help, we can actually give them help. Instead of saying, well, let's look at the database. So we got so-and-so over in Fargo. You know, why don't you talk to them and see what you can do? That's about the best we can do now. You know, that's not serious. Our national party is funded at the level of a broke nonprofit in the hood. It's just not sufficient for what we're trying to do. We're trying to take on 
The world's second most enthusiastic capitalist party is a conservative called the Democratic Party. They're the world's second richest party. And then, of course, the richest and most enthusiastic capitalist party, the Republican Party. And we can't do that on pennies and volunteers. We've got to have a staff that can support us. It's mostly going to be volunteers, but we need some people that, you know, can answer the phone, the email, uh, do the kind of social media work and website work we need to do, and uh, do it in a, you know, smart, sophisticated, up-to-date way so that, you know, people look at us and say, these people are serious. You know, that goes back to the question, you know, how are we going to persuade people not to vote for Biden? Well, we got to look serious for one thing, you know, and, uh, you know, the, the most important thing is start winning more elections and we can do that locally and, you know, we'll be able to point. That's how we do it. Thank you very much. Uh -huh. Thank you. Joshua. Hello, Joshua. Righto. So my main question is regarding anti-war and how you wish to, what's the word? expand that out to the American people. Because a lot of the American people, there's an absurd amount of uh, hero worship of anything regarding the military. And there's a lot of people who just simply don't understand the horrors of war. And that's one major factor in trying to get them to support defunding any form of military uh, spending. So how would you intend on getting the American people to, number one, stop the hero worship of the military, and number two, support defunding the military? Well, the hero worship is promoted by the military. You know, they have a whole propaganda thing from ROTC in the schools to flyovers at football games. Um, and then there's always a kernel of truth in propaganda. You know, those of us that have been in the military, I mean, one thing compared to the rest of the federal government and particularly Trump is there's competency there. I mean, now we need the military. They could organize the production and distribution of this PPE and ventilators and all the things we need right now. And uh, <laughs> Trump, the commander in chief, I mean, he pardons war criminals and ignores people that could help him in this crisis. I mean, so I think, you know, there's a respect for the military that I don't think we want to fight against. Uh, and you look at public opinion polling on military spending and it's most economic class issues. People are progressive. The military you know, they want to support it. And part of that's because, of you know, the mass media is always stirring up, you know, threats that don't really exist. Like, you know, I'm no fan of Russia, but there's no military threat to the United States, not a conventional threat, not even to Western Europe. I don't think they ever wanted Western Europe. They were trying to rebuild after World War II and we had that Cold War. They are a nuclear superpower. I mean, we've got to respect that and deal with that and try to solve that. But um, we need to change our foreign policy. And I think people don't realize this nuclear modernization is going on. We have no nuclear arms treaties left after next February 5th. Um, and so I think we have educational job to do. <clears throat> and then American people don't support overthrowing elected governments, you know, uh, Honduras, Bolivia, Venezuela. You know, they don't really support that. Um, and, you know, so there's education to do there. And then when we do get in these wars, like the Iraq war, I mean, everybody thought we were going after weapons of mass destruction and nuclear weapons and Saddam was coming to get us. None of that was true. And it took the body bags, you know, coming back to, to change people. So by the time Trump, I mean, Bush screwed up Katrina and then people looked at the war, you know, Trump, or, I keep saying Trump, Bush was toast. By the way, I think Trump is toast. Coronavirus is his Katrina. And the more he talks, I mean, Biden's best strategy is just go hide in the closet. That's basically what he's been doing. But don't screw it up. Let, let Trump hang himself. Good God. So anyway, um, I think it's an educational process. And saying, you know, people are tired of the endless wars. Trump got votes for that. He said, I'm going to bring the troops home. He's actually got more troops in the Middle East than they started out with. So, but he's a big liar. Um, so I think, you know, that's something we need to point out in this campaign. You know, Trump lied to us. He's going to bring the troops home. He put more out there. He's going to have Mexico pay for that stupid wall. You know, that didn't happen. So, you know, that's, I mean, I'm just, Joe Biden, you know, he was asked by Chuck Todd on Meet the Press 
does Trump have blood on his hands for his incompetent response? And Biden said, oh, that's too harsh. And I'm thinking like, does Joe Biden really want to beat this guy? I mean, come on. Joe Biden should just go in the closet and let Trump screw it up because his own people are starting to turn on him. I've seen that around here. I'm in upstate New York. A lot of Trump voters, I run into them. We talk about it. And they're shaking their head on this coronavirus thing. It's like, man, this is not what they bargained for. So anyway, I'm, I think I'm getting off the question. But, you know, it is an important question. And I say, you know, it's an educational process. And actually, I'm working with a policy wonk. We're going to specify with this 75% military cut what force structures, what weapon systems, what foreign military bases we're not going to spend any money on. And, uh, you know, it'll go to the Green New Deal and the Global Green New Deal. Let's be the world's humanitarian superpower and make friends instead of enemies. I think Sounds another good. thing uh, we need to emphasize is that we can advance our values, peace, democracy, human rights, better by diplomacy. You know, the Marines, I was in the Marines. We blow things up and kill people. That's what we're good at. And, you know, there's a place for that if you're defending your country. but you don't send them overseas to bring democracy. The Marines are not the, not the group to do that. So that's where, you know, diplomacy and providing real aid to countries is what we need to be doing. And uh, that's that will bring more peace than uh, fighting all these wars, which is not about protecting us, it's about protecting global corporations' assets overseas. Yep, and you can look at even 100 years ago, and we have Smedley Butler saying that he was in uh, Central America and South America fighting for these big corporations. You know, when I went in the Marine Corps, I was drafted. I went in, there was a whole GI movement, and they knew about me, and I had, they said you could bring one book for boot camp, and my book was The Politics of Heroin in Southeast Asia. And I wasn't the only officer candidate that brought that. The guy in the bunk right next to me had that book too. They didn't care about that, but I have folded into that book Smedley Butler's War as a Racket articles that were published in the early 30s. And they confiscated those. And of course, Smedley Butler's a hero. They tell you about everything he did while he was a Marine. They don't tell you what he did afterwards. So that got confiscated by one of these captains. And when I graduated that course, he, uh, congratulated me and then he winked at me and said I read those Smedley Butler articles and you know what was going on at that time they called it the Vietnam syndrome you know these these captains as well as our drill instructors and a lot of guys that I trained with they'd been grunts they came back they're in college they were coming back as officers Vietnam was not where they wanted to be they knew that war was wrong so anyway I got at least one Marine Corps captain got school on Smedley Butler post active duty. Always good to hear that. Thank you. Okay, I have Annie and then I have Jacob and we can take one more person on stack after that and then I can close off. So uh, type fast. Um, I wanted to pick your brain on your position with respect to the criminal justice system uh, federally overall in terms of, um, I guess just what is your platform related to the prison industrial complex and the injustice system that we have going right now? Because even though every state's a little different overall, we're a really um, punitive country and we overcharge, we over sentence. And I'm just curious as to where that falls in your platform. Well, we have mass incarceration because of the war on drugs. I mean, we do have the three strikes. We do have this overpunishment compared to other countries. But the biggest reason we have mass incarceration is the war on drugs. So president can pardon people, uh, I guess, for federal crimes. But what I think is all those drug prisoners, uh, particularly those in for nonviolent crimes, should be released, their records expunged, and they should go about their business with the support uh, so they can reintegrate into society, uh, which should happen within the jails. Instead of uh, taking revenge, we should be helping these people reintegrate. So there should be educational opportunities. Um, and 
uh, you know, things like uh, solitary confinement should be absolutely banned. The UN considers that torture. Um, and then other parts of the criminal justice system, we should have public defenders paid at the same rates as prosecutors and available to everybody who's charged. I mean, right now, over 95% of cases are plea bargained because the public defender is overburdened and they say, I can't defend you. You're going to get a better deal by copping to what they're accusing you of, even if you didn't do it. And you get a kid like Khalif Browder in Rikers Island, New York City. You heard about him? Three years in jail, allegedly stole a backpack. They never brought the charges against him. They finally, after three years, said, we don't have a case. You can go. But he was put in solitary confinement. He was beat by the guards. He was beat by gangs in there. He was damaged. He eventually committed suicide. In fact, his brother ran for mayor as the Green Party candidate to try to get some, you know, rectification of that. Um, that was a keen browder. So, you know, those kind of tragedies should not be happening. So um, we need, you know, a good public defender system. We need bail abolition. You know, those damn, you know, crooks around Trump were walking around free while people for petty crimes were in, take Rikers Island. The first guy that just died in Rikers Island, he had a minor parole violation. He's dead now. I mean, this is so insane. This is so criminal. Um, you know, the charges should be reversed. The people that are imposing this are committing crimes against humanity, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, we need community control of the police. The crime rates in this country since 1990 have been steadily declining. Street crimes. Corporate crime is up. And nobody talks about that, but street crime is down. <clears throat> Yet the police kill the same number of people today that they did then. It's it's like clockwork, about a thousand a year. And we've had review boards, you know, civilian review boards or citizen review boards, and that hasn't solved the problem. Bas most of them are advisory. A lot of them can't subpoena. The officers won't go. Um, so they're more, you know window dressing than a real solution. I think we should go back to what <clears throat> the Black Panther Party proposed, community control of the police. You have elected police commission instead of just the police chief. The commission has disciplinary authority. Uh, instead of having that investigated by internal affairs and the, and the punishment meted out there. And then in large cities, you have uh, neighborhood citizen review boards that can investigate cases if they don't like the results that come from the larger process. That's what the Panthers put on the referendum for Berkeley, California in 1970. And they tried to revive it in a national conference in 1973. Now they're trying to bring it back in Chicago because Chicago's police, you know, we saw what happened to Laquan McDonald. He's walking away probably high and they shot him, what, 13 bullets in the back? I mean, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, Eric Garner. We had a guy here from Syracuse named Johnny Gammon. He was suffocated to death too by suburban police in Pittsburgh. His cousin, Ray Seals, was a defensive tackle for the Pittsburgh Steelers. And uh, Ray's sister, uh, Rozzy, we call her, her name's Serena, is in the Green Party here. She's one of our state committee reps. Um, but we, we put forward back then, it's called the Johnny Gammon Law. J-O-N-N-Y, Gammon has two M's. You can Google it. There's an article by Reverend Larry, uh, Reverend, man, I'm blanking on his name, Larry Ellis, who lived in this neighborhood. He's passed on now, but basically he wanted a federal investigation for every violation of the human rights of a citizen, including police brutality and violence, because you can't trust the DAs. In a lot of states, the attorney generals are too tight with local law enforcement. So you have an independent uh, Department of Justice investigation. So I think we need that as well. Um, so those are some of the things we need to do with criminal justice. Okay, well, I, I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you all. Um, the way we're raising money is, you know, Bernie Sanders shows the way. He raised over $100 million in small contributions. And that's what we got to learn how to do. So I would just point out, um, you know, if everybody on the call gave $100, we'd be over the $5,000 mark. I expect most people, or at least some people, can't do that today, but maybe $25 a month. 
and you can set up a monthly contribution thing on that uh, online. So uh, you can make your regular donation without even thinking about it. Take us through the November election, which gives us a base on the budget, which helps, uh, you know, the campaign plan uh, how to allocate resources. Uh, also volunteering. I mean, uh, Ralph Nader used to say, give a hundred bucks in a hundred hours, I think is what he put it, uh, you know, over the course of a year. And if, a th you know, he had some numbers, you know, like if a 10,000 people did that, we could change the country. So, you know, we need help. We need energy. Uh, getting this word out, you know, it's not at the door to door street level right now because of the coronavirus lockdown, uh, but it's online and people who are better at social media than me know what to do, you know, share, like, post it places. And there are other things to do. I was talking with somebody who knows a lot about this. I didn't even know what he's talking about, but it sounded good. So whatever you know how to do, uh, we have, you know, you volunteer on the website and, you know, we'll plug you in. Like there's a, they did a phone banking party last night. I think they're doing another one tonight uh, to raise funds and get votes in various primary states. So, uh, you know, I'm just a voice for the campaign. The real energy has to come from lots and lots of people. It needs to be a movement. Not, you know, everybody play their little part and it'll be a big impact. So I just want to uh, highlight that. And then uh, remind you, I'm looking for your vote in the Colorado primary. I guess y'all from Colorado, except the young brother from California, who's too late for the primary. But he can vote in the general because he told us yesterday he's turning 18 in June. Congratulations. Have fun voting. And uh, that reminds me of one coronavirus demand that I think is important. We need to demand uh, the ability of everybody to do a mail-in ballot in November. Uh, we don't know if we're even going to be able to go to the polls safely. And, uh, you know, it should be the responsibility of the state governments, but the federal government making this a law they have to follow, that they have to get that ballot to every registered voter. So, uh, and the post office should forward those ballots indefinitely. In other words, if their six month forwarding thing ran out, post office ignores that and forwards that ballot. So that's my last point. I, I was gonna, you know, mobilize and motivate, but I thought of that balloting, which I think is important. So I, I wanted to get that in there too. So I enjoyed, I enjoyed talking with y'all.